Soon I'll introduce Susan Wilde, who will share her uh, brief introduction. But the theme of tonight is a town hall in which she'll share a brief introduction, and then we'll open it up to you uh, to ask questions. Uh, we're run no later than 8.30. If we end early, that's fine. At the very end, I have about a one minute, two minute uh, concept idea in my mind I want to share with you, but I'll wait to the very end that we, um, when we get to that point. This series, we have all three candidates here in the course of the next month. Uh, Tim Selfies, the Libertarian, will be here on uh, Wednesday, October 31st, and Marty Nostein will be here Wednesday, November 1st, so if you can come back for those, uh, that would be great. There's also something that we do locally here, uh, Thursday and Thursdays in Theology, I host at Braveheart, and this theme, not tomorrow night, but the following Thursday night from 7 to 8, you're welcome to join us. The theme is uh, taking your faith into the voting booth. Do we vote our faith? And it's just an opportunity to dialogue and, and talk, not to convince anybody, but to just listen to one another's opinions. We at this church want to be relevant and we want an informed voter. So thank you, Susan, for coming out. Um, please welcome with me, Susan, as we start our evening out. Thank you, Pastor Phil. Is this, no, this isn't on yet. There we go, now it's on. Hopefully it can all hear me. I can tell you it can all hear me. Uh, thank you, Pastor Phil, and thank all of you for coming out. It's, it's really an honor to me when people will take their, their personal time in the evenings and come out and, and hear me and what the other candidates have to say, because I think it's just so important that you know who it is you're voting for. Um, I love the theme of do you um, take your faith into the, into the voting booth. And I have to tell you, um, you'll hear in a minute, I, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. Um, don't hold that against me. But I, what I do is I, I try cases in a courtroom before juries. And one of the things I always say to juries at the end of a case is, you know, you can only decide this case based on the evidence you've heard in the courtroom, but don't check your common sense at the door. And the reason, I, and I just think it's very similar to the concept that you said, that you just said you're going to discuss. Do you take your faith into the voting booth? Because of course, it's part of what who we all are. Um, just like our common sense is hopefully something that all of us have and, and use. So I, I like that. Um, for, so for those of you who don't know me, and I think there are a fair number of faces that are not known to me, I'm Susan Wilde. I'm running for Congress. I'm 61 years old. I'm the mother of two kids who are no longer kids. They're in their mid-20s. My son is 25, my daughter is 22. And they're a big part of the motivation of what got me into this race for Congress. Not them particularly, but their generation and the generations to follow, their children and their, their, their friends and their future families. Because I'm so worried about the state of, of, of the country right now and what we are leaving our children, figuratively, um, as a future. Um, I'm also running for Congress because I believe firmly in the concept that all of you are very familiar with and that my parents raised me with, which is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it seems to me that the current Congress has been far too focused on the part about loving yourself and not enough on the part about loving others. And um, that to me is really something, it, it transcends faith, it transcends religion. It's really about what we should all be about in my view. I have to tell you, my, my mother um, was a, a force in my life, as was my father. My dad was in the military, he was in the Air Force and um, spent a career there. And my mother was of the Quaker faith and Always, always, you know, you know how you don't really think about how your parents are in, in instilling you with, with good things and, and your values and your faith when you're growing up, but later as you get older, when you become an adult, and honestly, the older I get, the more you realize how much influence your parents have had on you, you know, 
know, throughout your, your life. And my mother, um, as a lifelong Quaker from a long line of Quakers, um, was, was somebody who raised me and my sister to believe that all humans are created equal. And she taught us to believe in compassions for other, others and for doing for someone else before you do for yourself. And these are things that I feel very strongly about. They're, they're simple things, but they don't, they seem to be so ignored in today's world. Um, my mother was one of those people that would invite strangers to the Thanksgiving table. It's a tradition that I'm, I'm honored to have carried on from, from time to time at our own Thanksgiving table. My mother took me to, my mother worked with labor unions and when I was in middle school, I actually went with my mother to the picket lines where they were protesting for better wages for, for, for themselves um, as workers. So she taught me to respect workers' rights and to stand up for people who are struggling. My vision is for a Congress that works for the people that it serves. Um, a Congress that doesn't forget the poor, the sick, the hungry. A, a Congress, honestly, that doesn't allow families to be torn apart as we have seen over the past months. So that's something that keeps me awake at night. I know it keeps a lot of you awake at night. It's something that I, I think we really um, are not going to be judged very well in history books in the future, not treated very kindly for the family separation policies we've seen. Um, you know, 500 years ago, Martin Luther famously took a bold stand. He saw those in power using the language of faith to justify things he believed were contrary to the spirit of faith. And his act of defiance motivated others to draw on their personal faith in God in approaching the challenges that we face here on earth. And I think there's a lot for us to remember and learn from that. Today, people of faith um, and all of us throughout this country are, are seeing this happen again. We watch as the language of faith is invoked to do harm, to exclude, and to divide. We see it in those who talk about family values but then allow the separation of families to happen at the border. Um, we see it in efforts to prevent LGBT families from being allowed to live in equality and dignity. And we see it when politicians in Washington repeat the Sermon on the Mount and then vote to take resources away from the poor, the sick, and the hungry. So um, I, these are the reasons that I'm running for Congress because I really believe that it's time for us to return, if not to, I, I, do, I firmly believe in the separation of church and state, but I also believe very, very strongly that we must that our faith reflects our values and our government must reflect our values. And I think that that's what, what we need in this country today. Um, we see corruption in Washington. We see legislation passed every day that is to appease donors and the donor class. We see people using their power to further their own cause, their own welfare, their own ambitions. Um, and as a, as a lawyer, I was always taught to avoid conflicts of interest. And yet it seems that the concept of avoiding conflicts of interest has been forgotten in Washington. So in his historic act of, of protest, Martin Luther reminded people of all faiths that when those in power aren't using power to do good works, it's time to change the people in power. 500 years later, that lesson still endures. In our democracy, it falls to each of us as ordinary citizens to ensure that our representatives and our government is reflecting the values that we hold dear and our hopes for the future. If we don't like what Congress is doing, we must change who we send to Congress. Faith teaches us what to value. Government is our opportunity to translate our values into actions. It's time that we had a Congress that not only shares our values, but is ready to take action. And with that, I thank you, and I welcome any questions you might have about me, and about my candidacy, and about my campaign, and what my positions are. Thank you. And did I introduce myself? Pastor Phil. Pastor Phil. I knew you were Pastor Phil. Sorry, I should have said that. I get the first question. 
Um, and then what we'll do is we'll I try to rotate it either side, try to keep your question brief and to the point, so we get as many uh, questions as possible. Uh, and we're trying to rotate male to female as much as possible. Uh, my question is, we live in divided times here in the United States, so I think we're all aware of that. What practical ways would you uh, employ in order to reach across the aisle? So I'm glad you asked me that question because one of the things I prided myself on the most as a lawyer um, is, you know, I mentioned to you that I go to courtrooms and I talk to juries. My experience has been that most of my clients don't really ever want to end up in a courtroom. Lawyers love to be in courtrooms, clients generally do not. Even jurors don't usually want to be there. And so my job for, for the last 30 years has been to try to bring about resolution of disputes for my clients. And the only way you do that is by having the person on the other side feel as though they also are getting something, as though they also are winning in some way. And that to me is all about um, being willing to compromise, being willing to really understand the, per the other person or the other party or the other politician, as the case may be. I, people have said to me, if, when you get to Washington, aren't you excited to meet all the other Democratic members of Congress? And my answer always is, the first people I want to meet when I get to Washington are the Republicans. Because I think that if we don't form friendships, that we can't get things done. I do believe that the only way we move this country forward is in the spirit of compromise and, and meeting in the middle. And would you be willing to put Republicans on your staff? I mean, search Republicans out? Absolutely, yes. In fact, I think it's really important for, I, I have pledged to have a staff that is very diverse in terms of racial and ethnic um, makeup, but I also believe that it would be very helpful to have Republicans on my staff who can can help educate me on what the views of the other party are. Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I had two questions for you. And one. one. You're going to have to ask. Oh, only one. one. Okay. One. <laughs> what is, uh, just given what you're talking about of Republicans and bringing people together, what is your position on open primaries? In Pennsylvania. So open primaries, for those of you, well, in, as you know, in Pennsylvania, we have a closed primary system, meaning the only way you get to vote in the primary is if you're either a Democrat or a Republican, and you can only vote within your party. Um, you know, it's an, I'm not sure how I feel about the issue. I've been a lifelong Democrat, I will tell you that. But I actually think that we should be getting away from party labels, and I would like to see people voting for people because of what they stand for and not what the label is attached to them. So I think it's probably the way to go. I haven't studied it terribly carefully, but, but it, it seems consistent with what I think we need to be getting to. There's a question up here. Mail, any mail? Oh. There we go. Yeah, I can repeat if you need. Hi. Good evening. Um, I want to talk, uh, have a question about Social Security. Yes, sir. Uh, many, many years ago, and I'm not trying to throw punches as Democrats, but Lyndon Johnson took the, the dedicated funds and put them into general funds. Now, would you support a bill to put this back to dedicated Social Security funds only? Take it out of the slush fund that everybody, no matter which side of the aisle you're on, seem to use this for their own needs. <laughs> I believe can, you can you please repeat the question? Sure. The question the was whether I would support a bill to, to segregate Social Security funds so that they are just used for Social Security purposes. Did I fairly state your question, yes, sir? Yes. And the answer to that is yes, I would. I think we have to we have to shore up and preserve Social Security. Hi. Speaking of children and our children's children, uh, one of my major concerns and has been for years is global warming. And I know the UN just released a huge report. It doesn't look good. What would you do when you're elected, or what can you feel you can do when you're elected to address that issue? Well, as I mentioned when I first started, um, my my children's generation is, is I, I'm terribly concerned for. And climate change is right up there at the top of the list of things I'm worried about. Um, we, we heard we have 12 years 12 years essentially in which to act. I think that we never should have withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord. 
I was relieved to see Pennsylvania municipalities and corporations, not all of them, but many of them deciding to abide by the provisions of the Climate Accord, even though we've withdrawn from it. I hope that continues to happen, but I think we absolutely must take quick, decisive action to combat climate change. Susan, have you developed a position on single-payer health insurance yet? I have. I think... Can um, you explain that? Sure. Um, so the question was whether I've developed a position on single-payer health care. I have. I think the first thing we absolutely have to do is we have to re restore all of the protections of the Affordable Care Act, and we have to make it better and more affordable. However, I do, and I, I include in that that we should have a public option, meaning a, a form of what looks like Medicare, but not just for people over 65, but for people who are self-employed, small businesses who can't afford to buy insurance for their employees, for people who are wanting to become self-employed. Um, so I think if we have a public option as part of the array, that we will very quickly get to single-payer healthcare because people will see that it works and the reason I believe it will work is because we have to take the profit motive out of healthcare. We've got way too much profit involved in something that is an essential service that every human being in this country should, should be able to access good, quality, affordable healthcare. Here we are in the Lehigh Valley with two of the finest hospital centers in the state of Pennsylvania, and yet way too many people cannot uh, cannot afford the care in those hospitals. So the answer is yes. I grew up, as I told you, in a military family. It was the original form of single-payer <coughs> health care. And my parents, when I was sick, I went to the doctor. And it wasn't until I became an adult that I found out that people actually don't take their children to the doctor because they can't afford it. And that breaks my heart. <laughs> um, actually, my... I've been looking for someone to listen to me about the situation that happened and sort of follow through with what you were just talking about. Um, my mother is 94 years old and she fell last year. She had to go, sharp, very sharp, had to go into a nursing home. Since she had her life savings and owned a home, Medicare will only pay for 100 days. The skilled nursing homes cost between ten and fifteen thousand dollars a month until they say spent down, but to me is robbery. I don't understand how these homes can charge this kind of money. What costs ten and fifteen thousand dollars a month? Well, again. That's, a, that's an area where we most definitely have profit involved in the provision right. of healthcare services. And I will tell I, my sympathies regarding your mother. My, my mother died at the age of 82 at, with, from brain cancer. She developed it only three months before she died. And I was faced with the same kind of decisions that, that you had with your mother that were very, very difficult. Um, fortunately, both because of my father's medic, uh, military service and because my mother had invested in long-term care insurance years before when it was affordable, uh, those problems were alleviated. But my sister and I have often talked about the fact that it was hard enough to go through the death of my mother and her final illness. It, the idea that people struggle with medical bills while they're going through that kind of family tragedy it is really unbearable. But to get back to your question specifically, um, it has to do with profit and health care. Right, and I understand that, but can't the government put a cap on what they can charge? If well, all the um, gasoline company says, we're going to charge $10 a gallon just because we can, don't you think the government could come in and set a price? Like Medicare sets prices what they're going to pay. It's robbery because they know the game. As soon as they take all your assets, then Medicare will take over. And they call it spending down. It's robbery in my book. And someone needs to do something about it. It is wrong. Well, I they shouldn't be, if they would show me their financials and say, okay, this is justified, 
they can. What we're talking there, about. So that's all I wanted to bring to your attention. I, I appreciate what you say. I have. I really understand the issue. Um, there is some. You know, we we do have a free market system in this country. It, it, it's part of being a capitalist society. The problem, is, from my point of view, just like we can't re we can't tell private universities that they're not allowed to charge what they're charging, but what we can do is provide an acceptable public option. Unfortunately, the public option for elder care is often not the best quality, and that's really where the problem does is. Does Medicare cover that? Why doesn't Medicare cover? Well, it does to some. It does to some extent. It does to some extent. You can't cover every single. You can't. The government is not able to cover every single cost, but you absolutely can provide good alternatives. Is what I believe. Very good. Thank you. Just speak right into the microphone. I agree a lot with what this lady was just talking about. I had a similar experience with my mother. Uh, but my question is this. Hold it up. Um, it, it's apparent that the, all the Democrats vote in lockstep and all the Republicans vote in lockstep down in the Congress. There seems to be some kind of a force going on that makes them do this. How do you expect to resist this force and, and be able to work across the aisle, or at least vote independent. Well, as I said before, I think that we we all have to work towards the middle, and right now we're not doing that. I don't believe that we're trying to find consensus with the other side. The one thing that I do find encouraging is that as I talk to and meet candidates across the country who are running for the first time this year, I've seen a very diverse pool of candidates who seem to be independent thinkers. I don't think if you put a bunch of the current Democratic candidates in a room, there's not a whole lot of things that they would all agree to vote on in lockstep. I, I firmly believe that. I think you're going to see a new kind of Congress this year. I really do. But they do. But they do they what? They all say they're going to be independent, think independently, vote the issue. But when it comes down to it, they all vote in lockstep. Well, it hasn't always been that way. You know, this is a new, this is a relatively new trend in our government. We used to see, you know, back in, I mean, we all know the, the discussion about John McCain when he was, when he was ill. Um, and, but there are certainly examples that precede that from when I was growing up in, and in more recent years um, of, of people who are willing to cross the aisle. I think it's, it's a relatively new phenomenon that people just line up behind one party or the other. Well, like I said, there must be some force at work that makes them. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not there yet, but I hope there's not. Female. Yeah, I do. Email. Um, so we can find it here. Given what, what this gentleman is talking about and the nightmare of watching the government function or dysfunction itself, do you support same-day voter registration? so more and more people can move in and say what they think and they're not tied to the two-party system. Well, I think that we have to encourage voting rights across the country. We have to expand voting rights. We've got to, any form of voter oppression or suppression must be fought. And just like the question about open primaries, I haven't given a whole lot of thought to same-day voter registration. But anything that encourages more people to vote is something that I can get on board with. Uh, we have far too low a turnout. We see it every single time. Hi. Hi. Speaking about voting in lockstep, do you think that the, uh, the tax cut that was passed for the majority of tax paying citizens that has been a good thing leading to an increase in pay for most people, not just the 1% like you've been talking about, do you think that's a good thing? I think that that tax bill was misguided, and I don't think we're, that the average American is going to see the benefits of it, um, enough benefits of it. I believe, I believe we need a comprehensive overhaul of our tax code that needs to favor the middle class and working Americans. I don't see that. That bill primarily benefited the 1% and corporations. And it, that, and, There's no proof of that. Well, and the revenue 
gap that it has created in our federal government is going to be made up, in my view, on the backs of working people in the form of cuts to Medicare and Social Security, which I believe to be earned benefits, not entitlements. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a question. I, um, I have maybe 15 questions, but I'll go with one. Um, as Thank far you. as jobs in our area, um, oh, I know that Trump is in Pennsylvania tonight, President Trump, um, and he's been going around Pennsylvania saying that you know bring back coal and you know forgetting about the fact that coal is pretty much obsolete as far as you know good paying jobs go. I mean, I I think if you go through Wilkes-Barre, that's kind of an example of where coal went in general. Um, and so I wanted to know, for District 7 now, um, we have some big places that pay well, but we could really see some more industry in the area. Um, think about the new parameters, of course, for this year. Um, what do you think, um, what kind of industries do you think we could possibly move in here at a, a, you know, more of a federal level working with the state? Um, what are we looking at? I think we need to look at bringing renewable technologies to the Lehigh Valley. It would be, a, first of all, I think we have to look to the future. We have to anticipate 